Right, now this, this table is a bit complicated and, and I, I guess I, I, I thought twice about including it because it is so complicated. What I want to show you is that, that about the sheer variety of different ways in which case studies can be done. And what it tries to do, do is to talk about um, case by case, I, I call it spatial variation down the left hand side. Um, the, so the, the rows are actually different kinds of variations of cases. Um, and the, the columns, that in fact are just two columns, show you temporal variation across time. Um, there's either no variation across, or, or, well, of course there is always variation over time, but there's uh, no interest in the variation over time, or the study is looking at things as they change over time. Um, it's almost impossible not to include time in some sense with a case study, but some will be focusing particularly on things changed. So the example I just gave you of change in organisation, where you have a system beforehand and a system after, you're definitely looking at change across time there. Whereas in other cases, um, you, you might not be so interested in that. I mean, how a particular housing or, 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 or procedure of, of, of making uh, um, urban regeneration happen works or not. So that, that would necessarily not necessarily be a, a, a focus on, on time. And then the table indicates you know, these 10 possibilities of which the, 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 the grayed out boxes are the keynote areas for case studies. Um, when you talk about these kind of studies down here, you're more likely to be using some kind of survey design or experimental design or whatever. The case studies are really the grey ones. So um, the single case study, the single person being used in the case study, almost inevitably it's looking at over time. It's looking at things happening over time. It, there's not much point in looking at one person just as a snapshot and that's it. It doesn't tell you very much about the rest of society. But their change, their, their, their response to therapy, for example, if it's a therapeutic um, study, um, might be the, the main interest here. So you've got a single case looked at diachronically means across time um, or over a period of time. So a, 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 a clear, pretty clear-cut single case. Then you've got some variation within a case. And this is probably the most typical situation in case studies. You're looking at one group or, or one organization so it might be a company but you're looking at variations across that so it won't be it'll be perhaps some departments or different uh, employees in in the organization or it might be um you know, the larger scale like like the election in which case it might be different candidates and different parties and different um, um helpers in the parties and so on that you look at so there'll be variation within that and it can be just a synchronic, that's over w in, at one time point, looking at differences between the individuals, so party against party and particular worker against particular worker in the election study. Or it might be across time, so how do they move across time from before the election to the after the election and so on? How did they, their roles change across time and as the election went on and so on? So the focus is very much on that, those notions of change across time. And hence we get number four. Then we have comparisons between cases themselves and this of course involves multiple cases and you've seen one or two studies already where uh, it's involved multiple cases and that you certainly can do so comparing perhaps one company with another company or one um, one, one um, you know hobby society with another uh, society of some kind you know, one tennis club against another tennis club and so on so you're comparing in that kind of sense and then you can use the comparative method. And there's a whole set of issues that come out here, which I'll talk about in just a moment, about how you choose those cases. So a case study approach, but using several cases uh, is where you start to do comparisons. And of course, you can make those compare over time, in which case you're looking at a kind of comparative historical kind of approach. So how those organisations, how those different um, groups changed over time. So you get number six. When you get to a, a much bigger kind of set of many cases, of course, here you're really talking much more about a, a larger scale study, probably a survey. And in that case, you're talking much more about the, um, the general procedures for choosing your cases as a kind of randomization process. So you're really back to all those issues I talked about last week of how you draw you know, a proper sample from a population. And hence, these are more likely to be um, a much more of a kind of, of survey approach. Okay, so that's just a matter of thinking about, so I think what I've introduced you here to is the idea of having multiple cases 
and focusing on cases as they change over time as well, giving you a variety of different ways of talking about the, the research study. Okay, I've got to uh, the replication strategy. Um, those, that diagram I've just showed you showed some of the ways in which you can think about um, replicating and, and pre reproducing different cases and looking at different kinds of cases and comparing them. So if I go back to this, you can see that you've got some you know, between-case comparative methods going on here. So once you start doing that, the question that's raised is, well, how do you do that? How do you choose what to replicate, uh, what different kinds of cases to, to choose? And I'm suggesting here, and this comes, I think, from Robert Yin, this distinction of literal versus theoret theoretical replications. Literal replication is kind of more of the same, um, the same kinds of things to give you um, some kind of reassurance that, that what you're looking at is typical. So you just have more cases and you hope that by comparing those cases you can see that they're all very much the same and therefore typical. So the rep this kind of strategy is the literal replication, simply get more of the same to reassure yourself of generalizability. By comparison, another approach is to almost do the opposite, to, to pick different ones. In this case, led by a theoretical approach or, or, or a theoretical um, um, reason for, for choosing them. So you, you, you identify different cases according to your theoretical viewpoint because you think they're going to be different in some sense. Why do you think they're different? Because the theory says so. The theory you're looking at says that, I don't know, uh, in the case of people, that maybe age and gender are going to make a difference. Or in the case of organisations, maybe size and industry makes a difference. Um, or in the case of um, you know, um, sports societies, what makes a difference here is whether they are um, sports that are, uh, uh, you know, high profile uh, things like football and, and, and so on, or whether they're quite unusual sports um, by comparison. I don't know, like um, um, bog trotting. I just made that up, by the way, but, <laughs> you know, if there is a sport of bog trotting, I know there are people who go chasing through bogs up to their, uh, up to their necks in, in mud and so on. Bog? Bog diving. Bog diving, it's called. Okay, well, okay. There's, it's a minority sport anyway, by comparison. So, so another, if your theory says that's going to make a difference to looking at these, these associations and these societies, then, then maybe you look at different kinds of organisations for that reason. So it's clearly linked to the research question. The research question says, I'm going to want to find out these things. So that's why these, these differences are going to make a, a difference to my, to my answer. Notice in neither case are we doing any kind of statistical generalisation. We're not doing the kind of um, um, statistical or, prob uh, or uh, probabilistic sampling that I talked about last week in, in surveys. The, the replication is done for other reasons, sometimes simply literal to, to get more and to get reassurance that the case is typical, or theoretical to look at differences between them um, for that reason. So case study ideas are a little bit different from, from surveys in that sense. Just a bit more about theoretical replic replication. How can you do it? What kind of you know, grounds can you give for replicating different cases or looking at several cases and, and choosing different ones? Well, it could be in terms of the actors, and I've already mentioned gender, men and women, um, MEPs from different countries, say you're doing a, a, a set of case studies of, of the, the life of being a member of European Parliament, an MEP, um, then you might choose a range of different ME, MEPs from different countries, for example, because you might think that makes a difference. Or maybe different pressure groups. If your studies are a pressure group, it might be different pressure groups in that way. Different settings, again, you might choose different companies if it's a study of, of, of a, how a company reacts to a situation. I don't know, maybe your study is of, uh, is of takeovers, uh, in which case you might choose different kinds of companies in different, different industries because the takeovers will happen differently. If it's a study of a political party, you might look at different branches of that party um, in different parts of the country to see how they operate. Um, if it's local authorities, you might choose a range of local authorities to, to, again, because of the difference between different local authorities, if they're in a big town, they're in the countryside, or if they're in some, maybe they're in Scotland rather than England and so on, there may be differences there for, 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 um, for legal reasons. Events, if you're looking at events, you might 
choose to replicate across different kinds of events. Not just one election, but several different elections, because each of them might be particular for some reason. Um, selection meetings, imagine you're looking at the way that political parties select their candidates uh, at selection meetings. Well, you might want to look at several different meetings in different circumstances. So again, you might be thinking about theoret theoretical replication here, to look at meetings with different groups of candidates in different political parties, in different parts of the country, and so on. Or in the case of processes, you might replicate by looking at um, a, a range of, um, let's say, negotiating new laws. Um, you know, how does the government um, bring in a new act of parliament, a new law? Um, how, what is that process? You know, where do the ideas come from? How does it go through Parliament? How does it go through the House of Lords and so on? All those kind of things going on. And, and how, how do people affect that process? How do the political parties and the pressure groups and so on? And you might say, I just don't want one law. I want to look at a couple of, of, of occasions here to compare them uh, and to do some kind of replication across different kinds of legal situations. So one law might be to do with I don't know, um, the law about, um, uh, let's look at some things recently, something about abortion, for example, or about uh, you know, the time period. That's been an issue in, in politics recently about the, the time period that's applied there. Law about that. And by comparison, let's look at something else that happened recently, which was the, the law about um, um, occupying empty properties of squatting. Um, and, and the changes that will be made to that. So you might compare the two legal frameworks and legal activities to, to, as, as a kind of process of how it happened in both those cases. And I'll give another example of media strategies here of how you might, uh, might uh, again, you might look at different organisations dealing with different media. You know, how does, um, let's say, the, um, you know, a, a chocolate company, a company that makes chocolates, how do they deal with the media? How do they deal with uh, the printed media? And you might compare that with, say, how a, um, um, a university deals with, you know, the, the broadcast media by comparison. So you've got different media uh, organisations, different media strategies and different media involved across those. OK. Um, well, I said, you know, that, that's looking at replication, and, and I'm, I've, I've laboured this a bit because replication is, in this area, is slightly different from the kind of um, random sampling that you might do in a survey, different, different rationale behind it. But we don't always do that. Sometimes we pick a single case, and there must, must, sometimes there's a justification for picking a single case. And here's the kind of things that, that uh, the kind of reasoning that's gone on. I've given some examples as well. The single case might be a critical case, a test case in some sense. Um, and um, the example given here is, is Fessinger's work, When Prophecy Fails, or the book was called When Prophecy Fails. He was looking at um, basically what, what do people do when what they believe is found to be wrong uh, in some sense. And there were various psychological theories about this, but nobody was quite sure in these, in some cases, how it would work out. So he did a case study. What he looked at was a particular religious organisation. That was the case study of a religious organisation that was predicting the end of the world. And lo and behold, the end of the world didn't happen when they said it would happen. So what did they do? And what the, the book talks about this and his research investigated the different ways in which they, they responded to it. Um, so it was a critical case. It was it was clearly critical because it was an organisation fundamentally you know, set up to deal with the, the w coming to the end of the world. It didn't happen, so what did they do about it? Um, and there were various responses that Fessinger talks about. Some of them decided they, they, they got, got the facts wrong, they interpreted the, the predictions wrong. Others um, said that, um, they, that, that God was testing them and they passed the test. Uh, others said it, it was all a lot of rubbish, we were quite wrong to believe that, it's clearly wrong, and they gave up their beliefs altogether. So different people responded differently to, to that particular, uh, if you like, test case. Another reason for selecting a, a single case is because it's in some sense extreme or unique. And it's, there's no claim in this case that the, the, the case is typical in any sense. It is known to be unusual or extreme or whatever. But it's interesting for that very reason, because we sometimes need to know about extremes. 
Um, and that's very common in clinical cases, the single case study in a clinical context, in a, in a medical context or, a, or a, a psychiatric context, is often chosen because it is extreme, and we know it's extreme, but we can, in a sense, take that into account in the way we understand what's going on. And I think also Nigel Fielding's study of the National Front is an example of that as, as well. He chose a particular extreme right-wing organisation to look at. Everyone knows it's not typical of all political parties, but nevertheless it was important for the political discourse of the time and for understanding how you know, some people might be responding to you know, things like uh, racism and so on. Another reason for a t case is because in some sense you believe it is actually typical that your single case is not extreme, but quite the opposite, it is typical of, of, of cases. And you have good reasons for thinking that. And you may go to some, some uh, lengths to make sure that your particular case is typical by choosing the case so that, as far as you know, it's not too big, not too small, not too much that, not too little that, and so on. And I guess a good example of this would be the, the Lynn's study of, of uh, Middletown. That's a, a pseudonym for a, a small town in, in the States, the Middletown study. They chose it to be as typical as they could of small towns in America. It was about the middling size. It was about the middling kind of range of, of, of social classes. It was about the you know, middling in terms of the industries and so on that were there, etc. Hence the name Middle Town. It was, in the, it was meant to be a typical small town, and, but they chose a single case to do it as a community study, basically, of a small town. Would, that, would using something like that... Um mean you had to quite heavily rely on previous research to yes. support yeah. you. Yeah, yes, how do you know it's typical? Yes, uh, exactly. You have to say, well, uh, you know, other people have studied these and that and so on, and you have good reasons for thinking that those are the important facts. So I mentioned things like the size, the industry, and so on, the, the history of the place. You know, we have good reasons for thinking they're going to influence how the community operates, and therefore we, we include those as, as our guidance on tip picking the typical town. And yes, it's previous research, you have to rely on for that. Yeah. Okay, so I've, I've given you some ideas now about, about how you might replicate cases if you're doing multiple cases in a case study, um, which isn't a matter of sampling as such, but rather a way of picking for certain reasons, certain kinds of cases. Or if you're not doing that, sing, picking a single case, which case do you pick and different rationales for, for that, that, that picking. What I haven't talked much about, because I'm going to come back to this in, in later weeks, is about the actual methods you use. Um, just simply to say on this slide, and I'll go through these rather quickly now, um, the methods you use, I've already mentioned these, predominantly they are the qualitative methods. Not always, you can collect some numbers and do some counts as well. Um, but they're, they're qualitative methods. So observation, particularly participant observation, and I'll have a whole session talking about that uh, later on. Um, systematic observation is perhaps where you might do some counting. But observation in general normally is going on in a case study. Of course, interviewing, talking to people, asking them questions. Very often open-ended interviews. And again, I've got a whole session talking about that later on, about how to do that. Um, and of course, using documents and records. Uh, almost inevitably, whatever, you, whatever case you look at, there are records. Um, some of the examples you looked at, um, there were things like computer records and so on, and, and you could collect in, you know, quantitative information from records that way. But a lot of records are, are qualitative, you know, meeting, records of meetings and, and announcements of certain things and so on. Uh, patient records, diaries, uh, uh, etc. So they're the common ways you collect data. And as I say, I have a lot more to say about those in, in later sessions. How to analyse the data? Well, this module isn't really about analysis. I'm not, not talking much about that. Um, but typically, in a case study, and it can, it's typical of qualitative work, you often start your analysis while the study is still going on. You don't wait till the end, like you would do in a survey. In a survey, there's no point in analysing it until you get all the data in. Um, there's a temptation to do that, but it's a waste of time to do it. You have to wait till all the data are back in for analysing. But in a a qualitative study, and typically in a case study, you can often start to analyse data as you go. Um, and um, that may even change the kind of questions you're asking as you begin to analyse stuff earlier on. Um, what analysis strategy will you use? Well, I mean, the theory clearly uh, it has an, an impact on that. particular theory you're asking will, will give you the questions you're asking of your data. And it may even determine the kind of an analytic approach you take to data. 
Um, most commonly, people use some kind of thematic approach to analysing the qualitative data that they're gathering here. But it might not be. You might use a more kind of discursive or conversation-based approach, in which case that will probably reflect the questions you're asking. Um, Okay, to finish with, some questions about validity. Now, I talked about this at great length in, in a previous session about the ideas of, of what it means to say that research is high quality. High quality research is, I said, valid and reliable and generalizable, and, uh, and um, it, 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 it has some kind of basis in, 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 uh, in the, the kind of reassurance you have about how, how good it's, it, how well it's been done. Well, a case study clearly raises some questions here about validity. Um, and here are some of the common issues that come up in, in case studies. As I said, case studies tend to be based on qualitative uh, approaches with individual people. Um, and, of course, that can be unreliable. The self-report data you get from people, people telling you what they did, may not be what they actually did. And this is a typical question, particularly in interviews. When you ask people in interviews, did they do so and so? Have they done this, that, and the other? They may not be reliable. And that is one of the principal reasons why you often observe as well as ask questions. So a typical case study would involve some interviewing, but also some observations in order to, to check up those self-reports, to make sure that, that what people say they're doing is actually what they do. Unsubstantiated, observa sorry, un I can't even say that. Unsubstantiated observations, another problem. If what I mean here is that you observe things going on, but you're not quite sure what you're observing. As an outsider, sometimes it's not clear. This is a, a, a real big issue for a lot of participant observation research, where you're, you know, in an, in an organisation, in a setting, and, and and taking part in things. Because to begin with, you don't really understand what's going on. Um, and you may interpret certain things in certain ways, but actually it's later on, as you begin to understand more what's happening, then you realise that what you've seen is this, that, or the other. So by, by diving straight in and interpreting, over-interpreting what you're seeing, maybe without good reason or without that kind of reassurance that you understand things, is, is a way of getting results that are not true, not valid in that sense. Post-hoc unsystematic summaries. Um, again, there's a temptation because particularly in the quality field, you have so much data to deal with, the real temptation to, to give a summary that reflects what you'd like to find rather than what you actually have found, or simplifies it in a way that kind of doesn't quite do justice to, to what's going on itself. Uh, uh, one of the, the, I guess, the temptations of the sheer amount of data. And of course, the other side of that coin is, is speculation and overgeneralization, particularly as I've, I've, as I've stressed, the case study, there are real questions about how far you can generalise to other cases, to other settings, to a more general population. And you have to be very careful about that and, and, and be quite constrained in, in what you say about those things. Um, I think, is that my, yeah, that's my last one. Just a few points about common pitfalls here. Um, Token literature review, um, the, the, there's a temptation in case studies to dive straight in and not do a lit, proper lit review, to not understand what's going on in the background. Actually, that's true just about any piece of research. The, 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 a lit review is not often not that the most stimulating of things to have to do, um, but it actually is very important that you do it. Premature theorising, again, this is another version of the I think I know what's happening here kind of argument that you go into a setting knowing what you're going to find before you even start and you, and you, you theorise it and you come up with great explanations although it doesn't quite match what's actually happening so the temptation of, of um, having an almost closed mind to what you're seeing to, have it to, to, to going into a situation knowing what you're going to find before you, you do any research the phase slippage is a consequence I think of the, the complications and the complexity of cases it's very easy to to, to, to not to collect the right data at the right time and, 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 and keep things going along and, and keep in touch with things. The whole project gets large, unwieldy, and you let go of things and let things slip. Um, so you're not collecting the data you should be collecting at the time <coughs> it happens. That's particularly important, of course, when there's change happening or some event happening. You've got to be prepared when those things happen to collect the data, either before or after or both, if you're doing that. So that kind of control of things is, is a very important issue.